There have been several papers that have been written recently. Some of them are a little bit more technical, you know, physics papers a little bit. Uh, probably the, the most important uh, book, however, is The Grand Unification of the Sciences, Arts, and Consciousness, Rediscovering the Pythagorean Plato's Golden Mean Number System. And so I'll, I'll try to highlight that a little bit. But I've also done several other books. Uh, maybe what I should do is uh, maybe share screen. Is that okay? And then yep. show some of these images. Um, yep, you're good to go. Let's maybe start with. Uh, I can show you. <clears throat> so the first one I should probably point out is the one that is now in nine languages. Um, that uh, became an international bestseller. Um, is still selling. It's the the uh, most sought after book of wooden books is the golden section, Nature's Greatest Secret, uh, which by the way, Steve's and my mentor really, really loved uh, Keith Critchlow. Uh, another, now that also is contained in a book by wooden books where you have six books together in one, the Zinya, Technical Secrets of the Tradition visual arts which by the way can be purchased at a very very reasonable price that's uh, with six wooden books uh, in one uh, another uh, production which is a bit difficult to get I have a few copies left and we're going to republish it is Mysteries of the Amazon uh, visionary artwork of Pablo Amaringo and his students <clears throat> So I'll Which write was... I'll I'll write all of this down for folks if they're listening to this. So it will be in the, oh, in the okay. comments okay. below. Sure. Um, a little while back, I did um, reassessing the roots of theosophy in the pursuit of the precious stone, and really showing where the uh, theosophy actually started with the uh, the rediscovery of the of the canons of proportion by George Henry Felt. Um, and the theosophists kind of forgot it, that uh, they kind of uh, didn't really realize that the foundation of the whole society was based upon what Felt had done um, in an apartment of Madame Blavatsky in New York, and it started the whole thing rolling, but it's, it's incredible because it's all golden section. Um, um, now you have so uh, just published that in the journal and I'll put a link to that. There's an article by you and Melody, yeah? Well, that one, yes. Um, I can show that here in a second. Um, let me see. Go. The golden section, nature's greatest secret. If we're kind of starting this again, that's the yeah, one that's in we'll just go over nine languages. Second time, Okay, yeah. got it. Um, that's a wonderful yeah, book, very... folks, and uh, a really good uh, book to read before you do Scott and Melody's training coming up. Yeah, it's um, John Martineau did a wonderful job with some of the illustrations. Uh, so it's really, it's uh, Olson's and Martineau's book, <laughs> to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also included in Dizinia, yeah. Technical Secrets of the Visual Arts with five other uh, wooden books. And again, that's for people interested in sacred geometry and design. Uh, there's some pretty impressive stuff, Celtic patterns, Islamic design, curves, perspective, symmetry, and the golden section. By the way, symmetry mm -hmm. and the golden section, along with the Alchemist Kitchen, won first place at the New York Book Show for a series of books. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's <clears throat> Mysteries of the Amazon, um visionary when, artwork when was of, this when was this published this was 2017 but um unfortunately i never we didn't make enough copies to actually get it in onto the uh, the market uh, we it was part of the exhibit at the appleton museum this multi-million dollar museum in uh, florida let me just see if i can flip through a little bit to give you an idea so you get a, a, a lot of images of uh, artwork of the Amazonian artists. Really, these are all paintings that I 
possess, own. Um, over time, I've been collecting quite a bit. So uh, what can I say? When I went into the rainforest, by the way, uh, to work with the uh, the T, which would be the equivalent of what they were doing in uh, Eleusis with the Kukion, uh, this would be with the ayahuasca. They took a picture of my eye. And when I came out, they had done a painting because uh, they knew I'd be resonating with the big the big cats. So that's where that stuff comes from. Um, the uh, papers that we've been doing, there's some many technical papers. I'll show you uh, this uh, reassessing. Did I mention this already? No, uh, reassessing the roots of theosophy in pursuit of the pre precious stone. This was... Um, an attempt to really show theosophists what the uh, source of their organization really was. Uh, and it was a lecture in an apartment of Madame Blavatsky's in New York City. Uh, George Henry Felt had rediscovered the canons of proportion that were used by the ancients uh, in various societies, the Greeks, even the Romans, uh, uh, back with the Egyptians. And uh, this, uh, uh, has become quite popular as well amongst the theosophists. The main text that I've uh, worked on is a grand unification of the sciences, arts, and consciousness, rediscovering the Pythagorean Plato's golden mean number system. This is available as an ebook. I actually have the uh, the print copies. We really haven't put those out yet, but it's a uh, it, very, very interesting text, I must say. It's it's uh, gathered a lot of attention from many scientists around the world. And while I've got it up here, here's the one or the good of Plato and the indefinite dyad, what he called the greater. It turns out to be the golden ratio and it's reciprocal, the lesser. And this is the trinity at the summit of the cave that I'll mention when I show a, a couple of the slides here. So that's uh, those guys. We can talk about the uh, sacred geometry. Uh, and Okay, so Melody and I will be doing a uh, sacred geometry presentation March 12th, 19th, and 26th, and Roger is sponsoring it. Uh, we're looking at it as nature's pure language, and she's incredible. She is a Istanbul architect uh, who really understands design principles, has inventions that are really stunning for architecture um, that, that we'll disclose. And um, so I'm really happy to be working with her, uh, and we'll show the, the uh, paper we just recently published. We were down in Peru. Uh, in the fall, teaching the geometers that I, or the artists that I just, uh, some of them I showed you their artwork, and their students now, we did it all for free, and they loved it. We were teaching them sacred geometry to integrate into their, their artwork. Uh, here, this just very quickly, you see the, uh, this will be the presentation that we're doing uh, in early June in Portugal with the esoteric quest. And I just wanted to show this because I will be contacting my good friend here, Steve Bass, because uh, he's included here. I don't know if we want to want me to actually go through this right now, but I'm just drawing attention to platonic principles in high medieval churches. So it's going to be very, very interesting. I, Steve, I don't know. If, I, I don't think you're going, but that's why uh, I, I was hoping that uh, you and Alvin Holm could participate a little bit uh, in some of the the work that we do on this. Um, sure. Uh, just, yeah. just for folks who are listening in, uh, I will be sending out some information on the next Quest Tour, and it's held in the first two weeks of June. So if you're on our Academy Sacred Geometry uh, database and you get the newsletter, you'll be getting uh, information about that uh, amazing uh, tour that uh, Ralph White is setting up and uh, Scott is going to be there. Uh, Steve, let's hear your comments on that. Uh, on, on what exactly? Uh, just what Scott's just mentioned here. Well, I hope uh, I'll be happy to participate. Um, and um, I, you know, I certainly agree. Uh, <laughs> um, 
that these are the principles that uh, have uh, are the basis of traditional art and architecture. And, uh, and I think if we want to um, create art today that is, uh, gets us back to those, uh, to those principles, we need to study these things. And uh, I'm happy to have uh, participated in that study to some extent. I can't and do of the course we're good. Mm -hmm. And yeah. of course, we're going to be uh, highlighting the work of Keith Critchlow and John Michelle. Very and good. then two of our uh, important teachers who are no longer with us. And yeah. I just wanted to, uh, because yeah. Steve's here with us, here's Steve with uh, Keith and Alvin Holm. This yeah. is in Sam Samothraki. Oh, and good. they're on the, <laughs> and they're doing a panel discussion there, so uh, yeah, it's so wonderful to to be connected with Keith. We've already seen uh, my golden section book. Um, this is the roots of theosophy in pursuit of the precious stone, uh, which uh, Steve uh, and uh, Roger will give you a link to, so you can access that, uh, and. Um, in there, of course, we, we did some emphasis on um, some constructions related to the golden section and certainly how that leads to uh, the uh, semi-elevation of the Great Pyramid. It's very easy to get it out of there. But rather than going through that, that would, it would take a little bit of time. Uh, and well, actually, here it is. So. Uh, you have a golden rectangle here, and then you simply extend the sides. So if this is big phi, the greater golden section, um, you simply extend it up like this, create a square, and then you're able to, uh, through very simple geometric moves, create this golden chalice we'll see over here on the right, with that's the greater, lesser, square root of the greater, one half root two, root two, root three. And the point of doing this is showing how to how out of the three number principles, because the argument is the golden ratio and its reciprocal, they're prior to number. They are the results of the golden section, the, the, what the ancient Egyptians called the primordial scission. Uh, and they give rise to the other root ratios and the numbers themselves. And we'll see an example of how they create numbers in a moment. Um, they're irrational, so-called irrational numbers that actually create the rationals. So it's just so interesting. Um, so here again is the uh, <clears throat> image of my book. And this little trinity right here, the greater and the lesser along with unity one or the good is at the summit of Plato's cave. And that's what we're all in search of, but these permeate everything in existence. And um, uh, as pointed out uh, in a previous talk by Steve Vass, uh, it's true that for Plato, it's all memory. It's anamnesis, remembrance. And uh, in nature, you look at these, uh, numbers or relationships really ratios is really the key to the whole thing and you discover that they lift you up through the mathematical through the forms up to the summit of the cave in which you have the one in the indefinite dyad and very quickly here this greater is beauty this lesser here is truth and when you multiply them together you get one when you subtract them, you get one. And one is the geometric mean of the greater and the lesser. There is no other number that does this. And it's it's really at the heart of all of existence. I should mention that I had three uh, uh, co-authors, Lila Merrick Kranjic, Jiwan, she's in Slovenia, uh, Jiwan He, China, and Mohammed El Nashi, uh, uh, Egypt, also has residence in England. Uh, in an earlier topic, it came up about the uh, ratios and proportions in the human body. 
here I'm simply using the golden calipers that uh, you measure uh, the phalanges of, of the fingers and you discover they're all in golden ratio. In fact, the whole entire human body is a symphony of golden ratios, probably uh, more Fibonacci in a sense, because that's how nature works. Uh, these divine proportions and ratios get reflected through whole numbers. And that's when, why when you do counting, uh, you'll typically find uh, Fibonacci numbers or sometimes Lucas numbers, which are mimicking these uh, divine golden ratios. So here I just wanted to show an example of why the Lucas numbers, which are so incredible that most people really don't realize, you begin with two, one, three, four. In fact, here is your quadrivium right here. Uh, the tetractus, except you reverse the two numbers, and that's the key to the whole thing. And then you generate the other numbers. And if you, you notice here, um, the greater, again, if we can get in our minds that the larger uh, golden ratio is 1.618033 on to infinity, is simply called the greater. The lesser is exactly the same number uh, minus one. So it's 0 0.618, 0 0.339, et cetera. And when you have the zero powers of them, that of course is, is one plus one, you get your two. Notice how you alternately add and subtract all the way to infinity so that you then subtract the greater, uh, you subtract the lesser from the greater, it gives you exactly one. You add together the greater squared and the lesser squared, and all of these decimals to infinity, they all come together, and it gives you exactly the number of three. Uh, greater cubed minus lesser cubed gives you four, and so forth. And I have an image here uh, from Kronecker who said, God created the integers, all he also is, is the work of man. Well, the way they're created uh, is the greater to the fourth power plus the lesser to the fourth power come together. So you have 6.854, et cetera, and you have 0 0.145. You'll notice that all of these will add to nine all the way to infinity. So here's what happens. They collapse. And this will just take a second, but then suddenly you'll see what happens. So these are the manufacturers these are the pre-number principles that give us number. Fibonacci's are a little bit more tricky as to how that works, um, but Lucas is just absolutely pure. But Fibonacci's do the same thing. Any number is a combination of the greater and the lesser. And of course, the phylotaxis is really one of the keys uh, to nature uh, and how things work. So if you have Fibonacci numbers here, like with the pineapple, you'll notice you have five uh, spirals going this direction, eight as you go a little bit more vertical, and then 13. This, by the way, is the approximate geometric mean of these two numbers, except you're going to have to subtract one. So if you multiply five times 13, you get 65. Uh, eight is the square root of 64, so it's minus one. So one is going to correct all the way up, all the way down. It'll alternately be plus one, minus one along the Fibonacci numbers. And here is a pine cone, of course, where you see the same thing going on with 13 spirals going one direction, eight the other. 13 is to eight is an approximation to the golden ratio. One of the most important books that I ever came across is Symmetry in Plants by Jean and Barabe. But in the foreword, here's where they really lay it out, that the golden section is front and center of the mystery of plants. Daisies and sunflowers are the emblems of phylotaxis. All the problems of phylotaxis are summarized therein. And you get particular numbers, Fibonacci, sometimes Lucas. Lucas are more seldom, but that's because they're closer to the divine. They're closer to the, and they're more directly infused with the golden ratios themselves. The angle of 137 and a half degrees, when you golden cut a circle, you get 222 and a half, approximately at 137 and a half. And then of course, the golden number, they used to call it tau, tome for cut, uh, atom, atome would be uh, not cut, like the, the, but that's uh, the symbol. Today, we technically 
usually used big phi or little baby phi uh, from Phidias, who used them on the Acropolis for design. And as he points out, uh, these demand an explanation, and they've spurred humanity's intellect. And it is in phylotaxis, which means leaf arrangement, that symmetry in plants is the most striking and puzzling. So here is the uh, golden chalice uh, with your root three, your root two, and so forth. And what's interesting is if you simply extend this the length of one and then connect up to this vertex right here, drop your, your diagonal down, you've got exactly, this is what the Great Pyramid was constructed on. You have one, the apothem is big phi, and the uh, height is the square root of phi. Here you see a page from the book, uh, and Keith Critchell and I became very, very close in terms of studying these particular things. Uh, and as he pointed out, there are three special ratios. Uh, root three is to one, root two is to one, the golden mean ratio and both of its forms are directly related to the triangle square and pentagon, and they recur consistently throughout the proportion of the great buildings of mankind. It's interesting in the Timaeus, uh, Plato uh, is using what we call abduction. That was how, how he used it in the academy. He'd present the problems. Members of the academy would abduct the solution. He does the same thing in his dialogues. Um, he, for example, he starts out the Timaeus with one, two, three, but where's the fourth, my dear Timaeus? Well, yes, uh, they had four people there the day before, but one is missing today. But it's Plato's way of suggesting there are maybe three triangles. One, the equilateral triangle, which is mentioned by both him and Spusippus as representing one. All the sides are equal in one. Then you have two is the root two, the diagonal of a square, and then root three, which is the uh, bisection of an equilateral triangle. But then what's missing is the triangle that is used to build up the Pentagon, and that's what was forbidden to be revealed. So throughout the history of mankind, the golden section, golden ratio, golden mean, are what we now call the golden mean number system which is the lingua franca of nature. It is nature's language itself. Has, it's been reserved for initiates. Uh, here's El Nashi, my co-author. Here's Yuan He, and here I am. I was chairing the mini symposium on dark energy in 2012 in Shanghai. Um, here's a good example of how the divided line, Plato's ontology, what exists, and his epistemology, of how we come to know is laid out in the divided line itself, where you have the forms, the mathematicals, and the intermediate level. Here's the lower world down here, what he called the sensible realm. Here are ordinary objects, everyday objects, and this is belief. Then down the distorted copies, uh, and you find people with false conjecture because things are all messed up. These are the shadows on the wall in the cave. However, if one becomes illuminated, travels up out of the cave, up through the mathematicals, through Dianoia and mathematical reasoning, up to the noetic realm, and this is ep episteme, this is knowledge, whereas this is mere doxa or opinion down here, you ultimately move into the forms and then illumination when you reach the greater and the lesser, beauty and truth, and then you make the big samadhi, cosmic consciousness leap when you reconnect with the good or the one. That's the basis of really illumination and the whole project of Plato. So the golden mean number system may well be the most powerful tool in the physicist mathematician's arsenal. It emerges naturally out of Plato's two principles, which you just mentioned. Herein, we unpack its structural backbone in the golden series of exponential powers. So in the middle here, you see the number one, and on the right, you, you go up. Every number is multiplied by the modular big phi times 1.618. So you get phi, phi squared, phi cubed, etc. And then in the other direction, you're dividing by the same number. And so you get phi, phi squared, phi cubed. So uh, Allison, uh, the, through the looking glass, uh, eat mean, you go bigger and you grow smaller. 
but it's on this number line that the key is there, along with its perfect combinatorial properties of addition and subtraction and growth and diminution, as well as through multiplication and division via the modular phi. So you add, so you add any of these two together, you get the next number. Add phi and phi squared, you get phi cubed. Same thing with subtraction. You go the other direction. And everyone is a, is a multiple of phi or the div, division, division of by phi. Uh, so you go up and down. We unravel the underlying paradigmatic symmetry of any given golden power serving simultaneously as the geometric, arithmetic, and harmonic means. Now, in our uh, sacred geometry presentation, this is getting a bit more technical, and we'll probably get into this at the end, but I'm going to introduce it right now because it is so stunning. And in the process, we will reveal how the quantum parameters of quantum mechanics, including the pre-quantum particle, pre-quantum wave, Einstein space-time, what's called unroot temperature, Hardy entanglement, and the barbaro immersi parameter emerged naturally within Plato's famous Republic similes of the sun, divided line, and the cave. The golden mean number system has now emerged, re-emerged most completely and successfully in the E infinity theory where they're using Cantorian uh, space-time. And as Plato says in the Statesman, here's a good example of how this works. And again, he's hinting, you've got to be able to figure it out. He says it is in this way when they preserve the standard of the mean that all their works are good and beautiful. The greater, big phi, and the lesser, little baby phi, are to be measured in relation not only to one another, like phi is to phi or phi is to phi, but also to the establishment of the standard of the mean, unity between them. This other comprises that which measures them in relation to the moderate, the fitting, the opportune, the needful, and all the other standards that are situated in the mean between the extremes, Plato and the statesman, as you see. So here's what we did. <clears throat> this is in the uh, uh, Grand Unification book. Notice, first of all, that Plato's similes, they begin with the one, the good, and then you do a golden cut into two parts, and then you divide it into four parts. Now notice what's happening here. Each of these is going to be the geometric mean of the other two. One times four is four. Geometric mean is two. Two times eight is 16. Geometric mean is four. The golden section is the geometric mean of all geometric means. It is why the Egyptians were so enamored with it and based their great pyramid upon it. And as Badawi found, when he studied all of these monuments, uh, temples around Egypt, he found Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio all over the place. So as you see here, again, we have our, <clears throat> when you cut the one, you get little baby phi, 0.618, but then you get phi squared. Uh, and these two add together to exactly one. Then you golden cut them again, and you get phi squared is to phi cubed as phi cubed is to phi to the fourth. You'll find that these have to be equal in the center here. And then when you come to the cave, if you study it very closely, and I put the actual uh, citations here um, over on the right-hand side, you'll find that in the, let's go all the way to the bottom of the cave. Here are the shadows on the wall. Here are the puppets. Here's the wall, the dividing line. Puppeteers stand behind and there's a fire. And then you find another break where there's an ascent up to another level, up into the intelligible realm, where again you find shadows and then you find reflections in water. And then there's a transition to the world of forms into the real objects, the objects themselves, and then into the heavenly bodies, the sun and the heavenly bodies. Now, what we found, which is just absolutely stunning, and this is the absolute truth, you find, and here's the key to it, that each of what had been discovered in physics, in the quantum world, here's the pre-quantum particle, here's the pre-quantum wave, here's your key over here to them, phi one, phi squared, 
then the wave is to Einstein space-time as Einstein space-time down in this world is to unruh temperature. Then you come up here and you find your Einstein space-time is to unruh temperature, as unruh temperature is to hardy entanglement. This is the big heavyweight deal with uh, uh, super uh, conductivity that they're finding with feet of the fifth power. And that's where you get non-locality. So all of these things, and I say this to my dear friend, Steve, here's where science, where when you really search for the truth, you find it, uh, where you don't make up a bunch of scientism nonsense. And then ultimately, the very bottom here, this is all on this uh, golden series of numbers, you find the hardy entanglement is to the Barbaro Immersi parameter. Now, when I was in the rainforest, I was puzzled by where is the 137 and a half degrees in a pentagon? Because everywhere you find the pentagon in flowers, the majority of flowers are pentagonal. And of course, if you take um, the point to the point uh, of a petal in a flower, you find that uh, one fifth of 360 degrees is gonna give you 72. And of course, that's not 137 and a half. And uh, what I did find was the petals, I studied them very closely and I numbered them. And I started to realize they don't pop up in sequence, they alternate. So you go from one to two here, from two to three, three to four, four to five. And so you're really looking at the angle here. However, that would be 72 plus 72 is 144. Then I started, I had a visionary dream with the ayahuasca and I was literally told to begin nesting and go a little bit further out and of course when you create a pentagram inside a pentagon you get a smaller pentagon inverted inside and a pentagram inside and I went to the level in which I discovered the 137 and a half degrees the Archimedean lever, the power level of nature. And again, we really haven't published this other than doing it in, uh, in uh, PowerPoint presentations, but there's something going on here that gives you the 137 and a half degree angle. Here's the other thing. Uh, Lance Harding, who also studied closely with uh, Keith Critchlow at Vita um, and got his doctorate there at the Prince of Wales uh, Institute. They've changed names, et cetera, et cetera. However, he did his studies of the Golden Series and he indicated and showed very clearly that uh, first I should say uh, golden mean or geometric means one is the geometric mean between big phi and I'm sorry, little phi and big phi. But you slide it over and you see anywhere you slide it up and down the series, uh, you'll find that any number is the geometric mean between the two associated numbers. Ah, but the arithmetic mean is a little different now. Notice what happens. Um, the arithmetic mean uh, it has a different kind of asymmetric structure, but it's still using the golden series. And the harmonic mean, same series, but you'll find the harmonic mean here. Now, Adam Tetlow uh, reminded us, we knew this, but Tetlow did this wonderful book uh, on the canon, I think he called it, um, in which he, he laid out uh, his finding, and he asked, has anyone ever uh, discovered this before? And he asked Michael Schneider he, uh, and uh, John Martineau asked me, and I said, yeah, uh, Lance Harding. And, um, and, but this was real important that he showed us this because it reminded me what's really going on here. And all up and down the series, you can move these around. And so I was able to discover the paradigmatic symmetry where one of the indefinite dyad plays the role, not only of the geometric mean of the greater and the lesser, but when you add in the greater squared and the lesser squared, you immediately see what's happening. One simultaneously in the cosmos, in nature, is a harmonic mean and an arithmetic mean of the golden series. And so if you look here, this kind of helps you to see the, um, 
the symmetry and asymmetry. So the geometric mean is very simple like this. But notice that the arithmetic mean extends out to the left here a little bit because you skip one of the golden powers. And the harmonic mean does the same thing as you skip one of the powers. Now I realize this is a little bit technical, but it's really important probably at some point to share it with you. Thus it became clear that the three means, the paradigmatic symmetry can slide along the golden series while maintaining their internal structure. So you'll see here now, this is how nature is working. Oh, yeah. And everything else is flowing out of this. Yeah. And this this is in one of our papers that I did with El Nashi. Uh, yeah, this, this is incredible stuff. So all the three means centered on phi, for example, or phi to the fifth, which is the Harding entanglement number. You see what's going on with the other the unroot temp temperature and the, the uh, space time is here with the phi cubed. And then uh, same thing here with unroot temperature and so forth. Finally, let us note something. The MIT physicists led by Pablo Harillo Hararo discovered that bilayered graphene twisted by about 1.1 degrees allow electrons to become easily entangled and superconductive. And remember, when you get entanglement, you get non-locality. That's what connects everything together. We predict they will eventually discover this angle is precisely phi to the 12th power times 360 degrees. It's not merely 1.1, although that probably suffices because approximations do work. Just like uh, Steve will tell you the same thing. And we see this with artists who will use Fibonacci approximations um, uh, in their artwork or in their canvases. Uh, we'll kind of get it and it still links in, but it's going to be 1.1180, 2320, et cetera, degrees. This should give rise to the discovery of further quantum parameters as illustrated below in our Phi to the 12th Olson El Nashi entanglement centered paradigmatic symmetry. So we predict this is what they're going to be discovering in the future. Conclusion of this particular paper the essential features of quantum interconnectedness are that the whole universe is in some way enfolded in everything and that each thing is enfolded in the whole. This is how the one becomes the many. And it was David Bohm, one of my professors at Birkbeck who made this incredible statement and he's absolutely true. And at the root of all the deep questions when, within physics lies the number system one employs in the process. Together with E infinity theory, our E infinity theory collaborators, we have found that the golden mean number system is indeed the lingua franca, the language of nature itself. Its backbone emerges naturally as the golden series of exponential powers out of Plato's principles of the one and the indefinite diet. That's why it was so uh, forbidden to reveal what was revealed in initiation in higher states of consciousness in the mysteries. That's why, by, for example, in the uh, jungle, when I did the ayahuasca in 2005, one year before Golden Section was published, I was showing how this actually works. And it was so stunning, I was awake for 19 days straight, reconnecting with the eternal now each day. But this is the key to nature, and Plato knew it. It's the one in the indefinite diet. And it begins with the golden section, or as the ancients called it, the primordial scission. It's highlighted by its naturally recursive nature, similar to but more profound than its derivative Fibonacci number series. Fibonacci numbers are perfectly additive, but they're only approximately geometric. They're approximately each new number, higher number, is approximately the previous number times the, the greater or if you go the opposite direction, uh, the uh, previous number uh, divided by the golden ratio. Whereas the former, the golden series, it's perfectly additive, perfectly geometric, 
Furthermore, it harbors the most stunning internal structure of paradigmatic symmetry, linking all aspects of the golden powers together in this incredible symphony. And finally, we have shown how the quantum mechanical parameters, and we've already seen this, of the pre-quantum particle, wave, Einstein spacetime, unroot temperature, Hardy entanglement, and Barbaro Immersi parameter. These are the big names in quantum mechanics. Can be natch, and these are the numbers they're associated with. Can be naturally and effectively aligned within Plato's three similes of the cave divided line, sun divided line and cave. This is the process of how the whole universe is fractally and holographically enfolded into each and every part. The golden mean number system is the lingua franca and is the key to unpacking the fractal nature of the universe. Now, it's not only E infinity theory, as uh, some of us have already seen with uh, Robert Powell Sr. and Van Dorn. Uh, we, we've seen that they've used another system, and actually El Nashi has shown so many different ways of accessing it, but it always goes back to the one in the indefinite dyad, and then derivative root two, root three, and so forth. Penetrating into its outer fabric and its inner mysteries, it has reemerged most completely and satisfactorily in the modern era of high energy physics and cosmology, through the stunning simplicity of the many computational successes of the infinity theory. So here's where, our, where El Nashi comes in. And that's why everyone's so jealous of him, it, because he can do it with simple mathematics, whereas they're trying to use computers and large atom smashers, et cetera. And in the end, what we have on display is literally the answer to what Plato said is the greatest philosophical question of all. How does the one become the many. So then we come uh, to the new paper that we recently have done. And uh, I'm thinking probably I should stop here because actually, as I recall, this didn't, uh, it doesn't show up as well as uh, a different screen I can show on this. Let me see if I can get to it. We'll go here. Um, do you want me to keep going, Roger? Yeah, sure. That's fine. Oh, okay. Um, or any, any questions on what I, uh, or well, things, comments? At the... No, not, just keep going and then we'll open it up to discussion with Steve Bass. Okay, okay. So what Melody and I are doing is uh, sacred geometry and the transformation of consciousness. So we've looked very, very closely at the ancients and their use of sacred geometry, which again is pure geometry. And it's geometry that is linked to nature and the cosmos. And it, uh, as Steve Bass has pointed out again and again in his uh, presentations and his lectures, uh, it is universal. It has not changed over time. It is something that is always there because it's how nature and the cosmos works. But it's also what is revealed in initiatory experiences in higher states of consciousness. Uh, and what we're pointing out here is that we're going to do three days. The first day is going to be Mother Nature's Calling. And this is the value of Melody Seme Ajar, uh, is her work with nature itself, total immersion in nature's stones, plants, animals, and sacred geometric shapes. Now, this is what Iamblichus, the, the Pythagorean Platonist, uh, argued about theurgy. Theurgy is kind of divine working. And what you do is you first associate yourself and study the nature of nature itself, of the stones, the plants, the animals, and various shapes and objects. The second session, and these are just kind of general what we're doing, ageless wisdom is calling visualizing the rhythms of nature through mandalas, musical harmonies, chanting of words, mantras, the gamatria, where names are numbers, and really the secrets of number. We have this kind of defined more specifically uh, if one looks at this more carefully. And then in the third week, the third Sunday, we're doing this uh, three Sundays in a row for three hours each day, March 12th, 19th, and 26th. Uh, Transformation is calling. And this is really what it's all about. 
it isn't just finding these nice numbers and trying to, you know, understand them. It's transforming consciousness. As Krishnamurti says, if you don't have transformation of consciousness, it isn't worth a darn. Uh, sacred geometric ratios and proportions lead the soul to the archetypal realm of numbers up through Plato's cave, up through the mathematicals, up through the forms. The forms, by the way, are number ratio principles, uh, which are also qualitative uh, and ultimately up to truth and beauty, as we mentioned before, um, with the greater and the lesser. And then you ring the bell, you go all the way and you reach the good or the one. And in here, we kind of spell it out a little bit more. Um, but you can get this, uh, uh, Roger will send this out. And then we've kind of defined the three different events a little bit more closely with the total immersion, looking at mother nature and her language and the golden section, studying the body. But the thing is, it's not only in the cosmos, it's in the cells, it's in the microstructure as well. The cell membranes, platonic solids, canons of proportion, natural forms, and sacred geometric shapes. Then in our second uh, session, we'll be visualizing the rhythms of nature, the mandalas, musical harmony, uh, chanting of words, mantras, the gematria, secrets of number. And as John Michel pointed out, geometry and number were the main instruments why, whereby candidates for initiation, transformation of consciousness, were led up towards the climactic ordeal when the mysteries were unveiled before them. Initiates were made ready for it by their studies of the quadrivium, namely uh, number itself, arithmetic, uh, number in space, geometry, both plain and solid, uh, harmonics of number, number in time, and then spherics, which is uh, number in space and time. Actually, here is the quadrivium. I should have been pointing these out as we go along. Um, and so rhythms of nature, cycles of the five elements, visual and musical harmonies. We'll look at cymatics, how sound is translated into form. Again, the gamatria, secrets of numbers within words. It's very interesting. It's not, you'll find that um, uh, letters are numbers in Sanskrit, in Arabic, in Hebrew, and in Greek. Uh, very clearly. Some people try to do it in English, uh, but I, I found that those ones I've mentioned, absolutely no question whatsoever. So, so, so alpha, beta, gamma, delta, one, two, three, four. And five was a big number in the Greeks. Uh, epsilon, you found that all over Delphi because the Pentagon, the number five was so sacred. So third session, transformation is calling. Sacred geometry is the blueprint of creation and the genesis of all form. At the root of all cultures is a single universal code of knowledge, which has the potential to unite all things and all beings. Sacred geometric ratios and proportions lead the soul to the archetypal realm of numbers towards an experience of the one. Some topics will include, and it'll be more than this, but uh, we mentioned some of them, the root ratios and resonant states of consciousness, spherical thinking, the divided line in the golden section, of course, the indefinite dyad and how that relates to Plato's notion of the beauty and of truth, which are major forms uh, in the construction of all of nature or infused into all of it. That's why beauty really is as uh, Jesus is purported to say in the Gospel of Tam Thomas, uh, the kingdom of heaven is spread upon earth, but man does not see it. Sacred geometry and the lingua franca of nature doesn't have to be E infinity theory. The lingua franca is the golden series of numbers that all of us in the end must use to get there. Um, so we have uh, the, the uh, indefinite dyad, ascending Plato's cave to truth, beauty, and goodness visualization journey into oneself, and then ultimately oneness. But again, to remind anybody listening to this, we began with a deep dive into nature itself and try to figure out the codes of nature that are so obvious to us. And then finally, we have uh, Melody and I on the winter solstice, 
uh, had our most recent article published in Esoterica, which uh, will be available to everyone as a link. Uh, Steve has, uh, I'm sorry, Roger has it uh, available. And uh, here's just a, just a quick overview of it. Uh, sacred geometry, theosophy, and the transformation of consciousness. We get into the pure geometry to begin with, and we look to Lawler as, as pretty much of a guide. We look at the quadrivium and the five platonic solids. We look to initiation, and as Krishnamurti says, if you as a human being <laughs> transform yourself, you affect the consciousness of the rest of the world. If you transform, you become like the uh, philosopher's stone and you transmute everything around you. And that's really what's going on here. And then uh, here's a figure that uh, from George Henry Felt, mystic figure of the Egyptian canon of proportion. We find that people are doing something very similar, but this is really the roots of theosophy. I, I redrew it because I did not want to use Felt's uh, original image himself uh, and uh, going on. Then we look into theosophy and how this all came about. And, you know, it was uh, Madame Blavatsky who said, you realize what's revealed in the initiations and the mysteries. It's the secrets of proportion was revealed. And that's where initially Euclid's elements, that was what was used in the academy and it was secretive. But even in theosophy, if you really look closely, uh, we took one of the stanzas of the Book of Zion, which the, the whole thing is based on, which I've been looking for when I went to Bhutan, by the way, the original. And you see the spiraling of the uh, Fohat from the sixth chakra to the seventh, uh, from the brow center to the crown. And you see the different uh, imagery of the five strides and you, you have the square and the four holy ones. And of course, yes, it's very spiritual, some of the language, but you can't let that bother you. Uh, and you find again, you have the triangle, you have the pentacle, uh, you oftentimes have the number seven because septenary is really a number that gets used so often in all uh, 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 cultures. Uh, here, uh, Melody has put these together where you find, whether it's in cell formation or the cosmos, you find the same number organization that is developing. And the platonic solids in nature, you find here in water and methane molecules forming as tetrahedrons and bones of birds as octahedrons and uh, bacteria as viruses, as icosahedrons and so forth. So again, total immersion in nature, as Einstein said, look deeply into nature and then you'll understand everything better. And going on, uh, and here we simply took uh, the different symmetries, uh, the unity, and then the twofold and threefold, fourfold, fivefold, sixfold, sevenfold, and showing how they form in nature. And of course, you go beyond that. Obviously, there's eightfold, and ninefold, etc., and the decad. Uh, and then we get into transformation. And as David Bohm maintained, consciousness is a coherent whole, which is never static or complete, but which is an unending process of movement and unfoldment. And as Edgar Mitchell pointed out in his Samadhi experience, and by the way, I, I used to present with Mitchell on stage here in Florida. He loved my golden section book. He loved sacred geometry. But you know what he loved even more? He loved abduction. Um, yeah. the logic of hypothesis formation, what Plato used, what Steve uh, earlier was referring to uh, in an earlier event that we did with memory, anamnesis, non-amnesia, remembrance. These things trigger remembrance. And that's the key. Now, I, I do want to quote this. This is so important because this is what we're after. Here's what <clears throat> Mitchell said. I experienced a grand epiphany accompanied by exhilaration, an overwhelming sense of universal connectedness and ecstasy of the unity or goodness uh, that 
Steve earlier was talking about. And there was the sense that our presence and the existence of the universe itself was not accidental, but there was an intelligent process at work. I perceive the universe as in some way conscious, which it is. From that moment on, my life was irrevocably altered. You see why I get so excited about this, because that's what we're ultimately after. And as Krishnamurti, we quote him at the end, what you are, the world is. And without your transformation, there can be no transformation of the world. And one other thing I'd add to this is what I learned in Bhutan is, yes, we want transformation. And that's why Melody and I want to see, uh, teach the sacred geometry, as so many others do, because it links us up with the divine. But there's also the notion of what's called the Dharmanakaya, not Sambhogakaya, seeking the pleasure, or Dharmakaya even, ultimate release, and then you're gone. But sticking around and helping others is the bodhisattva vow. And I'll close with that. You postpone enlightenment to help all others, all of life, all of nature, transform. That's our goal. Nice, uh, very nice, uh, uh, Scott. Hey, look, let's open it up. <laughs>